Today we're talking to Marie Pavlik about the perceived and intrinsic value of women in the workplace. Turns out it's been a couple of uh, you know centuries and we're still not sure about it. If you think that things were great for women in their workplace before the pandemic, we've got some insights to share with you. So join Marie Genevieve Pavlik, president of Prime Alchemy, a division of Planning 101 Group Corp and Company, and the Clutching Our Pearls crew as we spill the tea and pull back the curtain on the normal that we are no longer enjoying. Of course, inequality for women is nothing new, but we have been settling for way less than we realized. Marie Genevieve Pavlik aims to help companies and people create real value and productive teams by implementing clear, executable strategies through game-based learning. Because if it's a game, the men will do it too. As a result, working with Prime Alchemy gets their clients a 75% increase in their team's commitment and accountability to the company, and hopefully to not being douchebags. Marie, welcome to the conversation. And Susie, welcome to you too. Thanks for yeah. having me. <laughs> I don't think we're going to have any fun with this topic whatsoever. Because no. I can remember back in 2004, going to a chamber of commerce and seeing that they had a women's group called, wow, women out working. Like what was the first time that shit had happened? And I thought, you're not getting a damn dime out of me. <laughs> because if you don't get it on this level, there's not a level that I can bring you to. No level. <laughs> no level. No. no level. We're new to the workplace, apparently. We've never been there before. It's all like, whoa, look at that. Then what when you get to wear trousers. Why were we doing <laughs> pantyhose for all those years? That single <laughs> thing was bullshit. Do not get me started on pantyhose. <laughs> get started on pantyhose. Oh my God. So, <laughs> all right. This is a, a sidetrack that's not really a sidetrack. So um, in my late 20s, early 30s, I worked for a Japanese company in Japan. And the CEO of that company loved the stewardess look. And so part of our uniform, which was not part of the men's uniform, is that we had to wear skirts that were above our knees and we had to wear pantyhose. And if we didn't, we got written up. For the little hat? <laughs> no, he didn't like the hat, but he loved the scarf. So we oh had the my scarf, God. yeah. You know what, yeah. not everybody has enough room in this place for a scarf. <laughs> Some of us have boobs that are right next to our necks. You'd still have to wear it. <laughs> yeah. Just like layers up. <laughs> <laughs> just layered up the, the whole look. Yeah. So, and that was not in the 50s. <laughs> just so people go, oh, that must have been like 1950 something. I'm not that old. So, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's modern time. And apparently that was our look. I've been written up at least five times in the first eh, six to eight months I've been there. Did it go um, in your permanent file? Yeah, it was in my permanent record. And I worked there for four years. So in my permanent record, it was insubordination, lack of pantyhose. Be the insubordination was the lack of pantyhose, by the way. It wasn't. I really you know. want to see lack of pantyhose on a form somewhere. <laughs> like a checkbox. Lack of pantyhose. <laughs> I would also like to challenge all of the men in that company to wear pantyhose for a week. Because the first time you fart in pantyhose and it has to decide which end it's going to come out of you realize that this is a bad idea. <laughs> Squeezing your butt together in that manner. Susie's lost it. Unhuman. Booty. Oh my God. Well, I've talked about this on the podcast before when I was doing tech support in 1994, 1995. And I'm like under desks, pulling cables and computers and plugging everything in. And I'm in heels and and pantyhose and you know of course I was the only you know lady tech in the IT department and I was you know and and so I had this completely um inappropriate for floor calling for floor crawling work outfit it was bonkers 
And it's really funny to me that you were written out for insubordination because we're supposed to be so very subordinate, you know? <laughs> well, we're going to come that, back to that one. Cause... Yeah, we are. But it's really, you know, it's funny. We, we joke about that happening in another country, but the truth is that happens here all the time. Women are, we're told what to wear in the workplace. We're told what not to wear in the workplace. We're told what to wear and what not to wear in schools. But those same standards of, of dress don't apply to men and boys. And I think the part of that that was so shocking for me was that it was explained to me when I was a girl that the reason there were those regulations was so that the boys wouldn't have impure thoughts. <laughs> because it's our, it's our fault that they have impure thoughts. It has nothing to do with they are human beings and they, you know, focus on their own crap. Not, I have nothing to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. with Marie, I, I really want to dig into, and it's so hard for me to say women in the workplace because everything in my soul goes fucking duh. But the fact that this is still a topic mm -hmm. and that is now an even more pervasive topic because I had a conversation with um, the, the, the CMO of a bank and she was saying, yeah, we've got this great new work from home structure, except there's a group of people that likes to still go into the office. Guess who it is? It's a bunch of old white dudes because they've been going into the office for all these years. And now they're in the office and still making the decisions. And we're enjoying our flex time. Right. We're no longer in the workplace. What are the shifts that you've seen since the pandemic, just with the perception of what a woman's place is in a workspace. So it's been really interesting. If we go a little bit before the pandemic, the issue was always mothers in the workplace or women in the workplace having to also deal with childcare. And honestly, we kind of had it down pat. You know, we had our childcare situation sorted so that we could be at work so that they couldn't use that as an excuse to not promote us, to not elevate us because we had children we had to deal with. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in a way of like, oh, these, these damn kids. It's really, that's how it was perceived in the workplace was, oh, these damn Sometimes kids. Sometimes it's like that a little bit. Well, yeah. Um, okay. Let, let, okay. Yeah. That's true. But, <laughs> but it is <laughs> a logistical moms, problem. Only, yeah. But, only moms can say it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with that though, what the pandemic did is that all of a sudden it wasn't just, oh, let's work from home like we've been trying to convince people to do before the pandemic, that people are productive if you let them have this flex schedule. We also then had kids that were also at home and being schooled at home. And the bulk of that work didn't fall on what we all thought was this co-parenting situation we were supposed to have with our significant others. It was, oh, if you were in a heterosexual relationship, it fell on the woman in that relationship. Whereas if you were in a non-heterosexual relationship and you were two women or two men, it got dispersed evenly. Yeah. So it was. it's very interesting that, again, the gender roles around men really was more about men in certain relationships where they felt like I still have to go out and be the breadwinner and go out and make money where sometimes their wives were making more money than they were, but yet she was still responsible for the childcare, which meant that the hours a day that women worked became longer and longer and longer. So it's, I'm up at five, getting ready for work, getting the kids ready for whatever they need to get ready for, jumping on a Zoom call. In between that, I don't get a break for lunch. I have to go figure out lunch for the kids, figure out, make sure they're not killing each other. Don't put the cat in the microwave. Oh, wait, I have a meeting now. Oh, wait, hold on one second. Wait, oh, wait, 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 wait. Don't put your brother in the microwave. Do I have to tell you not to put everyone in the microwave? The cat, your brother, the dog, the no one in the microwave. Okay, let's talk about the fiscal year. Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. Oh yeah. Those numbers are great. That was the life that people were having when they were going. I'm exhausted. 
And men are going, I love this. Work from home. This is great. I'm working in my PJs. <laughs> great, great. Or working without pants on Zoom calls. Right. Um, yeah. I don't remember any women having that issue. Did it's that funny? Yeah. Women didn't have that problem of being naked on Zoom calls. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> A couple of women didn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's all admit there was some there was definitely days that we were all donald ducking it and just <laughs> shirt nothing else not me no 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 i will not admit that because i did not do that because i believe in pants you believe in pants i believe in pants because i had to spend a lot of time in skirts so i believe in pants. <laughs> i'm gonna make you a button to wear I believe um, in pants so if we can if we get back up to before the pandemic real quick, because you were talking about, we were talking about the, the what we came to accept as the traditional workplace, the traditional work situation. Mm -hmm. So, and what what is the intrinsic value that, you know, I, taking it out of the fucking duh, because Marie is in the fucking duh section, but not everybody is. So what is that value? And then how has that changed? Well, you know, it's funny because we've, we've been in the workplace since the beginning of time, if we're going to be honest. Like, it's not like we just all of a sudden were, oh, wait, I'm in the workplace now. And so one of the things that uh, was discovered with women in the workplace is that we are much more productive. We are much more organized and we brought those skills to the table. Not to say that men are not organized, but we really brought that constructive organize that systematic way of thinking about work and home life balance into the workplace. And so a lot of that also meant that we had men that grew up with mothers that were in the workplace. And so they got real comfortable with the idea of not only women in the workplace, but women as bosses, women as equals in, in the roles that we had. And the problems that started to arise were the men that felt threatened by women that they realized this whole time we thought women couldn't do this job because they were too delicate or too feminine. And not only could they do the job, but they could do it better than some men. And that's what began that whole level of how do we get women out of the workplace? How do we start to, to push women down so that they're not being elevated up? And with that came the onset of you know, forcing people into a structured nine to five, forcing people into, oh, well, if you can't figure out your child care, you can't really work here. Um, and then all of a sudden women said, okay, we can figure it out. Don't worry about that. We'll, we'll figure it out. And so when we figured it out, it became, well, you know, I think we need to give that man a promotion because he's supporting a family and you're not supporting a family. Really, who are these people that you just told me I had to make sure I had that child care sorted for? So it was all those type of things rolled up in the workplace that on the surface, people didn't see. But underneath, this was going on with women. And on top of the chasing us still around the desk, the sexual harassment that still is going on to this day. And Absolutely. I had uh, I had a tech manager, you know told me, I, mean, I, I was introduced many times as a really good tech for a girl. And then I had one say that I was a really good tech for a dyke. Oh, <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> we're pulling out D words today. <laughs> <laughs> Did you it might be the first time that word said on our podcast, Mary, but you know. That's okay. Well, you know, and, and the funny thing is like, well, is that supposed to be an insult? Cause it's not. <laughs> Thanks though. Appreciate yeah, it. totally. You learned words. Yeah, <laughs> and I think there's, I think there's a lot to be said about just the perception of what it means when somebody steps away to take care of a family member. Yeah. So if you're a man and you take a half a day off to take your child to the doctor, what's the perception? Oh, he has visited a pediatrician. Really yeah. If you're a woman, you're unreliable. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. It's such a kick in the lady nuts to be like, wait a minute. I hold all of this up 
all the time anyway. But Paco <laughs> takes a half a day and he's a hero. Oh, yeah. I take a half a day and I'm a liability. Yeah. And I've done three times the work before he got it. Mm -hmm. And so we're already coming off of that toxicity or not coming off of it because pff, where the fuck did it go? Still there. But I know that I teetered on a nervous breakdown during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. What kind of stress impacts did you see as we went through going from sucky as hell to extra suck during the pandemic? And are you seeing that sway back or is it just us swallowing the stress that we've always swallowed because somebody's got to do this? Well, so here's the funny thing about that. People are now starting to rebel. So you've heard on the news all the time about this great, um, this great resignation that's going on. And we hear it on the news quite a bit. And the reality is people you know, at first people said, oh, people are coming to work because they're they're getting these stimulus checks or they're they're not going to work because of this and that. The truth is people have begun to realize, you know what? Enough is enough. I don't need to put up with this anymore and I don't need to come back to you. And now people are looking for companies that are going to not only respect the work that they do, but they're also going to respect them as people. And so we're hearing about it slowly, but the truth is it's been happening a lot longer than the news has been reporting it, that women are like, you know what? Fuck you. I'm out. I'm out. I'm not playing this game with you anymore. I'm out. And unfortunately, it was caused because you had people, lit, no exaggeration, working 24 hours because they're just trying to balance work and home and they're tired and they're burnt out and they're looking at their family that they're not bringing their best to. And they're going, why am I doing this? Why? Gotta give. Yeah. Something's got to give. And then they realize, you know what? I have been giving my blood, my sweat, my tears to this company that could give two shits about me. I'm out. And so that's what's going on now. And if companies don't recognize that it's not just, oh, we're losing talent. No, you're losing real talent. You're not going to be able to sustain. And it's, it's showing. How long have you had to wait in some places to get service? How long have you had to, oh, wait, we don't have the supply chains not fixed? It's not just about not being able to get goods from other countries. It's also about the fact that we, we can't produce the things we need to produce because we don't have the people to produce them. Because they have told everybody to. Yeah. Yeah. And so. And with all of the manufacturing outsourcing and stuff that's been happening for so long mm -hmm. by, you know, relinquishing those manufacturing, you know, we've set ourselves up for that. We have. We've set ourselves up for failure in a big way. Uh, one, because we have only looked at manufacturing with 50% of a potential workforce, and we've left the other 50% out in the cold. And then the 50% that we've looked at and said, hey, this is our workforce, we stopped training them. Mm -hmm. We no longer have those technical training high schools or even community colleges that do technical training. So they're out too. So then we outsourced it all. And now we're like, oh shit, we need to bring these people back. And so we're, now we've got kids that are going, you know what? Nah, I'm not really interested. I don't really want to do that. That's not really sexy. Convince right. me. And then we have women that are like, I would love to do that. And guys looking at them going, but can you? Can you lift a 50 pound pallet? Yeah, are you sure? Puppy? You look no. so delicate. <laughs> Let me tell you about delicate, like a bomb. <laughs> so as we were seeing ourselves come out, uh, let's face it, we're not coming out. As we're much not. as I tried to tell people in January when we launched the revolution, 
that nobody's going to want to play your reindeer games. They were like, no, we're going to go back to normal. It's going to be great. Cool. See who shows up to work for whatever Todd took her job so she can do her job and his job because he's not qualified for less money than she was ever making. And he's making more than she was when she left. All of this stress has stripped. I, I, I want to say women, but I'm going to say it's stripped humanity. Yeah. Of our ability to have boundaries and filters and my God, like I can't, I, I'm, I, I feel so blessed that I only chose to give birth to one human because if I was outnumbered, <laughs> I would not have been by the time we came to this point. Right. Um, <laughs> when a woman is under this kind of stress, how does that seep out into the different structures that she is responsible for carrying? They begin to fall apart. I mean, you know, we all wish we were Wonder Woman. Like, I really wish I was Linda Carter or, uh, you know, Godot. Um, that'd be awesome. But <laughs> the truth is, we're not. And so what happens is, it things start to fall apart. We can't maintain that level of stress for long periods of time. And eventually, we're going to see a rise in heart attacks. We're going to see a rise in obesity. We're going to see a rise, which will lead to all other ailments. We're going to see a rise in mental health issues. We're going to see a rise in physical abuse and um, emotional abuse. All those things are going to happen because we haven't built into our society systems that will help people through this pandemic. Before the pandemic, we didn't have those systems. And now it's just, you know, we're seeing sort of the fruit of our lack of labor in that sense. But there's some things that we can do about it. I don't want it to seem like it's just doom and gloom. And one of the things that we can do about it is that as women specifically, we need to begin to not view each other as the enemy in the workplace, which means we need to tell the truth about how much money we make. We need to tell the, tell the truth about how to get promoted and to move up. You know, when we, we talk about the boys club and we do it in a joking manner and we do it in a serious manner, but one of the things that I have a lot of respect for the boys club is that they really are a club. They stick yeah. together. They got a brother's back. Yeah, they bought like, you know, they're not going to leave another one out to dry. And we have not done that. Although I have a lot of excitement about this next generation of women because they recognize they can't leave each other behind. And so they want to have these conversations. They want to talk about how much money are you making? Um, how should I ask for a raise? Who should I talk to? They want to have those networks and that coaching and that development. And that's super exciting because if we band together, we will not only help each other, but we will help all of us, the collective. Because aren't we, aren't we officially 51% of the population? If we are, we need to start acting like we're the majority. <laughs> We need to start acting like we're the majority and, and not just, you know, half of the population. And the truth is, there is no population without us. So we need to start recognizing that we control the population. We control the powers that be. And we have to stop giving up our power to old men who they're going to be dead soon. Let's be honest. Like Mitch McConnell, dead soon you know, he's going to be gone. So we need to start acting as if he is. <laughs> oh. You know, you talked about how we control the population. And I think that's true when we have control and power over our own reproductive choices. And so yep. it's really interesting to see, you know, the, the flex, people wanting flex work. And then shortly thereafter, even though it's always been a thing in our country, there's the, you know, the changing of the reproductive rights in Texas and 
work getting worked on in other places. Yep. You know, I think in a lot of ways we have to degender nurturing because yes. and we have to degender being a provider because and we have to because when men are forced by other previous generations of men into the role of provider you know they can opt out of all these other things and when we are forced by each other and by previous generations into the caregiver and the nurturer you know it's like there are women who are crappy nurturers they can provide all day long and there are men who are forced into you know seeing as a failure for how they provide when it's like maybe that's not what they're supposed to not what they're supposed to be you know and we are think, brutalizing think, each other with gender roles yeah I think that's such a critical a, a critical point because Listen, we know that there is going to be a massive shift in how business works. If we can be brave enough, if we can be strong enough to define our roles for ourselves, which I think this beautiful, tasty little crack in the patriarchy has provided us. If we're going to choose our own lives we get to choose our own roles within those lives. Yeah. And I know that for, for me and my alpha doggy self, I have some qualities that serve my daughter and I have some qualities that don't necessarily serve my daughter. And that when I do have either my squad around me or a partner that is a true partner and can give and take, I get to be more me than I've ever been. And I think that we, that model is effective in the business yeah. sense where if we stop paying and rewarding things like time served and the expectation of society on who should bring home the bigger piece of meat. Mm -hmm. We're going to be able to neutralize a lot of the expectations that have been forced upon us. And don't get me wrong. Those expectations have been built in since the Bible. How do we turn our turn our work lives into a place where we can be whole so that we can turn our home lives into a place where we can be whole because you can be whole at home and you can't carry it into work but i know that if you can be whole in your career you can be more whole in your home life and that's exactly it if you are whole in your work life, you will be whole in your home life. You will bring it. You're absolutely right. The first step to that is that we have to now look to companies and say, we want something different. Not, we hope that you give us something different. No, we want something different. And, you know, going back to this, this generation of millennials that people always talk about, oh, millennials are so horrible. They're not. I love them. And one of the things that they're starting to do is they're starting to demand that they not only have work lives that are not balanced, but harmonious. Because the truth is there's no such thing as work-life balance. They're recognizing we want work-life harmony. We want to not look at the world in this nine to five. You know, if I can get my work done by two o'clock, why am I sitting here doing nothing for you? Why can't I go out and do something else that's going to make me whole again so I can come back and do more work for you and better work? And so companies that are... That are actually, <laughs> sorry? You're incentivized the next day to kick ass in six hours instead of eight. Right. You're incentivized to be creative and thoughtful in how you do your work instead of just they paid for my butt to be here for this many hours. My butt will be here for that many hours. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. That is exactly it. Beautifully said. And the truth is we have to have companies start to look at work 
as opposed to the hours put in, but the quality of the work, the project, the productivity. And people have to start not only just demanding that, but working as if, um, as if that's the norm. Is nothing's going to change unless we start demanding the change. The companies that get it are getting it. They're moving their workplaces around so that they're accommodating people because they recognize people don't want to work like it's the, you know, the industrial revolution. They don't want someone hoarding over them in this tower, looking down at them going, you must work now. You are a horrible person, you know, in the sweatshop. Why are we, why are we still in this? Even though we have better work conditions, we still have that mentality. And it's so, like our kids in a Charles Dickens book. It's it, not okay. Really, really it, it, that's really it. And this is not just for women. This is for men and women. This is for all of us going into the workplace. And when we stop looking at jobs as gender specific and start looking at what are the what are the skill sets, what are the qualities, what are the values, what's you know what's the behavior of people going into this particular position, and less about are you wearing trousers or are you wearing a, a, a dress to quote like a 1920s style mentality, we will get more product productivity out of people because you're absolutely right. There are men that are amazing at home. They were kind of, they're nurturing and they're loving and they're married to women that that's not their wheelhouse, but damn, are they the best at whatever it is that they do in the workplace they're the person that you want there that has your back in the workplace because they're amazing. And that's and so, a more important kind of harmony. Right. You know, and that's a much more important kind of harmony. Like, am I doing work that I see value in that work? Am I doing work that others see value in the work I'm doing? Is the work I'm doing for the people I'm doing for, do they see the value in my work? And then ultimately, do my peers see the value in my work? And if I can answer yes to those four questions, then I'm fully engaged in my work. That's the secret sauce. And it's getting people to understand, people being companies, to begin to understand, I don't want people punching time clocks. I want people excited about the work that they're doing. And it's not about saying, well, you know, they have to be in an office to do that. There's some people that love, love, love to be machinists. That's their passion. They enjoy it. And they're seeing the value in their work. That's a fully engaged person. So that, that's really the first step is how do we get companies to see it? We force them. We say, look, the great resignation is what's going to force them. Mm -hmm. You don't want to treat me like a human being. You don't want to value me. I'm out. I'll go find someone who will, and they can. And they can. And I think that's, I mean, that was the entire impetus between that made me start the revolution was if, if I'm someone who has created my life since I was 22 and have been like, I'll live on the razor's edge as long as I get to call the shots. But now I forgot that I have choices because everything is crashing down around my shoulders because mm -hmm. here we are pandemic land and I don't have enough emotional resources right. to step back and remember who the fuck I am, which I might go grab my crown in the back because we all know I have one. Like, how do we pass that into our the next generations of you are here for innovation not automation. Yeah, and that's that's a huge responsibility that we bear. Uh, and I say we, but I mean women of my generation. I'm a Gen Xer, and we bear that responsibility of helping younger generations and our own generation to see that our mental health is important. You know, we can't give what we don't have. And you're right. Right now, there's you know, yes, there's a lot of jobs out there, but right now there are women specifically that are so burnt out, they can't even see the choices. And so how do we help each other do that? First of all, we got to be honest and say, I'm burnt out. And there's no shame in that. Yes. You know, there's, there's no shame in saying, I've had enough, I'm burnt out, I can't see straight. 
Because if I can say that, then Marie can say to me, okay, how can I help you? You do. If, <laughs> That's what she says to me all the time. <laughs> yeah, how can I help you? But if I don't trust you enough, if I'm not trusting of the network that I've built enough to go, you know what? I'm not doing well in this pandemic. You know, my Insta, my Facebook says a story that is not real. Oh. And I need to be honest and say, look, this is what's really going on. You know, I'm lucky if I can get a shower in, you know, makeup. What is that? <laughs> you know, to be honest and be able to say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm put together by bubble gum right now. Right. And not feel like there's judgment in that to go, okay, so, okay, how do we get you like put together with something a little bit more solid? And being accepting of that help. But the first step is we have to all acknowledge mental illness is the same thing as if you have a cold, if you have a broken leg, it's an illness. It is not anything to be ashamed of. My leg's broken. My heart's broken. Same thing. My brain's yeah. broken. My I brain's treated broken. my energy like it was a constant fuel source and it isn't, yeah. you know? And I think there's so much beauty in that, in what you just said, that the vulnerability that we have been forced to embrace is what's going to save us. Yeah. And if you can't break down and be authentic with the people who actually give a shit about you, then you have built the wrong tribe and you need to go find a new one because I'm there are other entrepreneurs, there are other women in business, there are other women that are going to show up the minute you let that mask fall, mm -hmm. because we are a society in and of ourselves. We are a tribe that has always circled around one another, but we can't find you and we can't see you. If you are constantly putting on the Betty Crocker dress and laying on the floor to take yourself a nice five minute nap between vacuuming and making the dinner. We have to stop. And the reason they were popping so many pills in the 50s, though. <laughs> That's how yeah, they were drunk. And they were popping <laughs> pills. <laughs> I'm going to say it wasn't a bad way to get through the pandemic either. <laughs> I, I'm not judging. <laughs> there is, is this a judgment free zone? <laughs> There's but no judgment. I think. I think what ties us three very different women together, even though there are two Maries and like one Susie, right? <laughs> that no matter where we come from, we have a need to connect authentically. Yeah. And the more real we can be and the more whole we can be, the better we're going to be for everybody in our lives. And let's face it, we are women. We are the filter through which everything happens, whether it is the happiness of your family, the wholeness of the experience. Nobody ever looks at dad and says, well, I wish he made me lunch more. I wish this happened. And if, if, if dad had just, you know, helped sew my tutu, mm -hmm. that's not how it works. We have to come together as entities of power and femininity and vulnerability to create a place to heal and to move forward. And Marie, I love your concept of gamifying this kind of experience so that it does take some of the toxicity out of it. Because I can tell you how many times I've walked into a room to do sales training and they watch a five foot blonde chick get on stage and everybody in trousers is <laughs> like, what's she going to show me? I'm going to show you up, out, down and sideways. Give me a minute. <laughs> and then, you know, they ask me to fire that guy. But, <laughs> like it's, it's us coming together to say, we don't have to keep these shields up. We don't have to keep these gender normatives up. We don't have to keep these stereotypical roles up and it is okay for you to break and I will be there for you. 
but you got to let me see. Yeah. And we also have to make it okay for men to break too. Yes. Yes. That's a huge key is that, you know, in a lot of ways we're lucky because people expect us to cry. You know, that's part of the gender role that we have. But men have to cry and they need to cry. And the truth is, Tears are just the body's way of releasing emotion when it cannot release it any other way. That's really all it is. And if we start to normalize the idea of people being upset and expressing those emotions, no matter what gender they are, that becomes normal. And so one of the things that I really have everyone do is I have them take their cell phone and go through their cell phone and I want them to pick one person that they would trust with every, with their life, every secret they hold, that they would never lie to. And that person, they have to actually text that person and tell them, today sucks. That's it, today sucks. And if that person responds back to you, that's your person. If they don't just look at that and go, oh, <laughs> But if they can say, what, what, why does it suck? What happened? That's your person that you have. Every one of us has one person in our phones that we could just go today sucks. I don't need to have a conversation about it. I just need to go today sucks. Yep. <laughs> and if you don't have that person, then we need to get you that person for your own sanity. Male, female does not matter. You need that person in your life. And so I have for a long time called that business girlfriends because I have about 15 on my phone that I can dial. And sometimes I have to dial through like eight to get somebody to answer because everybody's busy as hell. Yeah. Right. But I'm like, I need to scream for five minutes and then I can go back to being human. Mm -hmm. And my promise to them is that I may not be able to pick up the phone, but I will always call you back. Yeah. I am your lifeline. I will listen and I will listen like a woman without trying to solve it. Amen. <laughs> I will be here for you so that you can scream and get back to kicking ass because you don't deserve to be caught in that space. And on that note, Marie, I want to thank you for sharing this space with us. You are an absolute blessing. I cannot wait to see <laughs> what is coming next because we are going to do some badass stuff together. We have got an entire world to change. And between me, you, Susie, Ryan, who is our unbelievable support person in the room and all of these incredible people that we are working with, we're going to take this burnt ass scorched earth and be beautiful and wild in something new and healthy and if we're not going to do it now then when yeah. and if it's not us then who i want to thank you so much for sharing your time your wisdom your smart assery with us today it was incredible Susie, you always bring such a depth of insight to the conversations that we have and i'm so appreciative of the spirit that you bring. And I'm so very proud to say that clutching our pearls is just a small part of my dream for the future for this world. But take the information that you've heard today and do some shit with it. Yes, we're entertaining as hell. We get it. It happens. But if you don't take this and move it forward, then it's your fault then you're part of the problem. And today, I want to ask you to be part of the solution. Find a way to help. Find someone to be their person. And if you don't have a person, you can find me. I will hold space for you. I will find the time. Ladies, thank you. And let's clutch our pearls and wait for a pantyhose-free life (laughs) that we can all enjoy one toot at a time. Maurice. I'm all for Marie supremacy right now. It's just... (laughs) (laughs) 
One two at a time, girl. One two at a time. Marie is my favorite Marie. I'm telling you seriously. <laughs> right back at you, girl. All right, thank you all for joining us. We will look forward to seeing you on the next episode.